Hello, my name's Amanda Foxen Hill and this is Suddenly Autistic, my vlog where I've been journaling what it's been like and what it feels like to ha to get a late diagnosis of autism. So I received my autism diagnosis when I was 46, 47 um, and I'm now about to turn 50. Woohoo! So that's that's late. <laughs> that's late in one's life. There's been a lot of water under that bridge of life and um, what I wanted to do with this video log is really give myself a goal, um, sort of a, a direction from which to, for which to put my thoughts. So receiving that diagnosis along with the generalised anxiety disorder, the complex PTSD, and also I had a previous diagnosis of ADHD, um, that's quite a lot to take in and there's a lot of understanding that I needed to do, a lot of research, a lot of thinking about myself and reframing things that have happened, so rebuilding my um, my internal narrative of, of how my life's gone and what I'm doing, all of that sort of thing. So just really going back and re-understanding and reshaping and doing it in video form has been great because it's actually given me a goal, something to, to work towards and to share. Um, and please follow me if you follow me on the on the webs if you want to. So um, you can subscribe to this vlog. Um, I post content infrequently, to be honest. It might be every couple of weeks. It might be once a month. It might not be. I, I basically put things up when I when I have something to share, some some insight. Um, about myself so it's a personal journey it's about me and it's about how it feels to be alive as somebody who's autistic who found out later in life and um, who's quite a thought a deep thinking person or an overthinker they would have said but I don't classify myself as overthinking um, so yeah please come and join me today I'm talking about masking and other behavioral management strategies now you'll hear me say masking and masking because where I lived where I grew up and this is kind of an, a masking thing so where I grew up there was two ways of saying things we were just in that sort of area of England where you could go either way and it was generally depending on status, social status and education and, and something else. So you would call it the kind of the class system. So if you were a working class or sort of less well off, if you like, or just an everyday person, you might say to mask. So you'd go ah with the A. Whereas if you were a more well-to-do um potentially wealthier person you would say mask so it would be the r would be the a so that that's something that i've struggled with um not because i try to hide where i'm from because actually i don't care it doesn't bother me but i guess it's just one of the things that i found really hard to settle on and i and i literally do so throughout this video you may hear me say masking and masking because actually they both come out easily in different situations it's really hard to make myself do the opposite one unless i'm when i don't want it like it's better off for me to just relax and go with the flow so i will say both and that's not me masking or masking my um, status it is literally that my brain has cottoned on to both of them and will use both of them so there we go we started off with an example gone so what I usually do when I'm making these videos is I'll have a some topic will come up some situation usually triggered by life events a conversation I've had a situation I ended up being in something I've read or seen on the telly or on the internet or whatever and it's got me thinking and this topic of masking or masking has really been getting me thinking for a while because I personally would say that I'm not a big masker or masker I can't get over it now I'm gonna to have to let that go but I don't think throughout my life that I've been particularly good at this skill of masking and it is a skill um, I don't think it's something that I have been able to engage with that consciously because it seems like just a big faff to me a lot of effort to try and hide things about myself you know so so anyway it's been a topic it's a topic of, of, in, of interest to me um and something that i would have i would instinctively say i'm not a big doer of however that might not be true so that's why i've made this video and that's why i've done all the notes as well so here we go let's get into it 
So first of all, what is what is what is masking? What is it? Um, apparently, and I've kind of copied this from autism.org, although I've added a couple of extra words at the beginning. It's a behavioural management strategy learned by some autistic people, so not all of us, consciously or unconsciously. So we might go out and try and practice this or it might just be assimilated into our being. But it's a, um, a strategy learned by some of us to appear in, um, so that we can appear non-autistic or less autistic even so that we blend in um, and are more acceptable in society are more accepted by society so this is a behavioral um, strategy behavior if you like it's behavior that can happen at home it can happen in formal settings it can happen at school or work or whatever less likely to happen at home unless people have different motivations like maybe they like masking i guess i guess in some ways you could say it's a bit like acting like an acting can be fun um and it can be something that we choose and have a play and, and be creative with um but if you've got to become someone else just so that you don't get murdered for example which is an extreme example then that doesn't sound so much like a good thing in fact it sounds like a massive burden so really this journey is going on to to into that delving into that masking how it comes about what it is how we do it and how I feel how I feel as someone who's autistic that when you know when this sort of conversation comes up the first thing that struck me was this idea that it's a strategy to appear non-autistic. Now, as somebody who's late diagnosed, I have basically been autistic for all my life, but for 47 of those years, um, which is much more behind me than potentially is even in front of me at this point, if I'm you know, brutally honest. Um, so for, the, for, for pretty much the majority of my life, I didn't even know I was autistic. And I'm just going around being autistic in public just my brutal autistic self um or was i maybe i was masking subconsciously that is a thing but i didn't know so i couldn't consciously choose to become less autistic because i didn't know i was autistic in the first place it's really hard to develop strategies for coping with a situation you don't realize you're in I realised that I was showing up in ways that were causing other people to notice in the difference. So I realised from a young age that I was someone who created a bit of a situation for other people sometimes in as much as they noticed me in a different way to the, the way that they were noticing average other people. And it's hard to say normal. I sometimes use the word normal. I know that that's also not a thing. There isn't a normal person out there, but it's hard to know how to describe it. When you do feel like you've been different, you've been othered in a group of people, it's hard to work out, you know, this is an invisible disability as well. So I can't say, well, it was just because I was a girl and everyone else was boys, or it's because I was 10 and everyone else was 20. It's an invisible difference. So there was this invisible difference about me that was speaking for me before I even had the language. And yes, so I couldn't go home and practice being less autistic because I didn't know I was autistic in the first place. So it's really, really hard. And I think that's a, a big reason why I've ended up with this um, complex PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And yes, it is bad. It does cause nightmares on a regular basis, dysregulation of my body and nervous system, panic attacks, lots of different things. So it is like PTSD, but it's complex in as, far, in, in as much as the triggers are everywhere. It's literally living in a minefield. Um, I've got 47 years of being triggered to to this point um, to, to fall back on, so a lot of content. And um, yeah, it's mainly because I couldn't keep myself safe. I, I didn't know myself. I didn't know what was triggering, what was upsetting, what, was, what other people were noticing about me. So I couldn't do anything about it. So it's really hard to be in that situation when you actually don't know what the problem is. Um, or what the situation is if you don't even want to call it a problem. Some I looked up some examples of masking just to see well what what do people do what are what are the things and then I could learn of, I could maybe reflect on those and see if actually that is something that I do or something that I recognise. So here are a few common examples. They're not all of the examples, but they're the common ones or some of the common ones. 
So firstly, forcing yourself to make eye contact in a way that doesn't come naturally to you. I had no idea that my eye contact is not typical. No idea at all. I was completely oblivious to that. I thought that I made eye contact in a non-remarkable way, but it turns out that's not true. That my eye contact can be um, deciphered by others as perhaps a bit shifty at times. Maybe I'm lying because I'm not looking at the person. Maybe I'm distracted. Maybe I'm not interested. Maybe I'm ambivalent. You know, lots and lots of those negative things. So my eye contact is quite autistic. I, I actually didn't even realise until I got my diagnosis and started thinking about eye contact and researching it, I didn't realise how much it actually physically makes me want to vomit. I'd gone all of that time in my life not realising that something as simple as looking into someone's eyes can actually make me want to be sick. And this isn't just people in general, like random people or horrible people or whatever, this is every people. This is all the peoples, um, including my husband, including my children. That doesn't mean to say I can't look in their eyes. It, I can, but I don't enjoy, and it's it's not even actually, that's the wrong word, I don't know why I said that. It's not even on a whether I like it or don't like it. It actually physically makes me want to vomit. It's quite a difficult thing. And um, yes, that, that feeling does, does sort of grow the longer I do it. So there are periods of time when I can hold eye contact. Um, but yeah, basically, do I... Do I do normal eye contact? No. Do I mask it? No. Why would I? Why would I? To be honest, I've got to this point in my life. Okay, why would I? Well, because obviously, obviously, not obviously, but I've said that people have framed my body language in a negative way because of the way I hold eye contact. They've made negative assumptions about me because of it. Well, so it would be in my interest to learn how to do it better. But it makes me feel sick, so I'm not going to do it. There's a flat out no. I am going to take the, 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 the consequences. Because you know what? I actually don't care what the people think about me. It's not my problem. It is my problem when they think that I'm shifty and they don't trust me. But I'm quite confident that I can demonstrate in other ways that, I'm, that that's not true. And if they don't pick up on that and they're just judging my, me by eye contact, well, actually, it's their loss. And, and I think that's how I've always been. Um, it's hard to know for sure. I'm sure things things will still upset me. They do still upset me. And I'm sure I've lost opportunities and, and um, you know, had people say things about me or judge my character in ways that aren't, aren't great. But like I said, life's too short. I can't be fair. No, not doing it. Mirroring, second one, mirroring or otherwise consciously choosing facial expressions such as a fake smile or more neutral than intense resting face. Now, this is something I tried. So when I was a teenager, I don't know how old, probably 16, 17, I remember having a couple of days where I decided that, you know, I was going to go out there in public and smile. I'm going to have a resting smile face. I'm going to walk through the high street with a smile on my face. Why did I decide that? Well, because I'd received negative feedback, as many women do. So this isn't just something that autistic people face the consequences of. This is something that humans can be judged for in general, just all of us. So, and especially women. So I've always had a rather scowly um, or concentrated, you know, constipated even, constipated, concentrated, all of those things face. So when I am not um, doing anything in particular, my face will often rest in a kind of concentrating scowl, which is why I've got that beautiful line there, if you can see it, it's amazing. Someone did actually, a young girl actually, when I was in my 30s and they were in their 20s, they were saying, oh my God, oh my God, you need to get Botox on that. I have Botox, preventative Botox now, to stop me getting lines like you. That's a terrible line, you need to get Botox. To which I was like, yeah, no. <laughs> I've got better things to spend my money on, and no thank you. Anyway, so mirroring or otherwise consciously choosing facial expressions such as a fake smile blah 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 yes i did try that i tried it like i said as a teenager it didn't go well in fact i think people thought i was just lost the plot completely because i did it badly so i didn't just do a neutral gentle smile at that point i did a uh, mannequin smile all day i made my face hurt 
people were even weirder to me so I was like nah forget that too hard I can't do it I can't I, just forget it so I've been quite good all my life at trying things occasionally and then going no it doesn't work it's not worth it it's too hard for me and just dealing with the consequences so I've got a bucket of consequences by this point um for trying masking and it didn't work so that's fine I just put my backpack of consequences on and keep going it's quite heavy but I'll keep going so a third one would be sitting on your hands so you don't flap them or become overly animated in conversation. I don't do that either, do I? <laughs> look at me, look at me go. I've got hands, I use them, sometimes badly. I knock into things, I've always got random, well not random, they're actually logical. So I've always got bruises everywhere because I do walk, talk and move with all my body all of the time. So I'm quite a mover and a shaker and it hurts and it's not always a good thing, but I am not gonna stop it because I need to, it's like sign language with the hand, like it's brilliant, I love it. It makes me, I don't know, I'm not gonna stop that either. In fact, when I think about it, I wanna do it more. So maybe I'm oppositional. Is that such a bad thing? Fighting back your natural reaction to pull away when someone unexpectedly touches you. This is what people do when they mask. I do not do that. So, so far I've got a brilliant record of not actually either trying them and giving them up or not even going to try it. So people have and do continue to touch me because I'm adorable. Um, no, I'm not. But people do sometimes come up to you and want to hug you. It's a very Australian thing. When we moved from England to Australia, the thing I really hated was that people wanted to hug you. Some people even wanted to kiss you. Sometimes twice, like the Italian, whatever. Maybe three. I don't even know. It was gross. I didn't like it. I do not want to be kissed, hugged or touched by anyone, really, unless I've expressly said that that's okay or you know me very very well in your close family and we know we've got a thing going on about how to do it i hate soft touch i hate that you know i don't like unexpected touch you know get your hands off me i don't like being squeezed to death either so there's a very specific way i like to be touched by very specific people in very specific circumstances and everyday life isn't that so no i am not gonna mask that if someone comes up to me and touches me i am gonna look mad and depending on the situation, I might even tell them, no, don't do that. Ooh, ooh, you know, I just will. Because, yeah, so I don't do that either. So planning conversations and scenarios in advance, which is called scripting, is a form of masking. I do do this. I'm going to lean big into this one because this one helps me. So I didn't realise how much I enjoy scripting and planning until I started to realise it was something that I was doing. And it was, and then bridging that gap and, and, and actually cementing it as, oh yeah, that actually does make me feel better. Because my thoughts and my feelings don't always marry up. I find it very easy to be in my head and being logical, like a body, a brain with no body. And I then have feelings at other times, which I can't explain because they don't seem to marry up with my situation. Putting the two together, so I have brain and body connected as in one huge, huge somatic human, is quite hard to me. It doesn't come naturally. So I've had to learn to knit these things together and, and the way and actually these videos are really helping me because it's forcing me to think about my to think about my feelings and to feel my thoughts. See what I did there. So, yeah, in terms of masking, I can give myself a solid yes for that one. Planning scenarios. I've started doing it a lot more with restaurants when we're going out. I do it with movies and stuff but and concerts, obviously. But like knowing the details, knowing the layout of a place, understanding what to expect, where you can park, that sort of thing. It's just it's it's good life skill anyway, I feel. But for me, it literally, I was surprised at how much it reduced my anxiety that I didn't really realise I had until I knew later on in life that I'm an autistic person <laughs> how exciting dressing to fit while um well, dressing to fit in while trying to ignore the discomfort slash awkwardness of it now I've tried this and I'm not doing it again no 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 so when I started my career I had a sales type of job so I was in sales and marketing and I'd go out on visits and whatever I noticed that throughout my time as a sales rep, I noticed that some women 
um and men but i wasn't really focused on them at the time because i was you know it's like well these are my peers you know what are they doing should i do it so i was noticing what the women were doing and wearing and a lot of women would dress like in for power they'd have their nice suits on high heels or, or heeled shoes court shoes whatever they wanted but something where you know they look put together neat and business like this was a business job i had it was a professional job good salary company car all the rest of it i did that to the level that i was comfortable so i had a suit but i didn't always wear it together i certainly didn't go for the shoes so for me the hard no was shoes i could only ever wear shoes that i was comfortable in and yeah they'd be nice enough and i tried to get the more businessy light ones but there was no way and there's still very little chance of me putting on high heels occasionally i will and i have got some more comfortable ones but you know this is a long way to round the the thing that no I will not do that go back further in life before I had left high school I think I might have been at high school or, or, a, or I'd, I would have been at uni somewhere around that but I did buy myself it was probably at high school actually I bought myself a handbag and some court shoes and they were very expensive I've spent a lot of money on this to duo and um, I'd put them on and I'd march myself into town and walk around thinking that right this is the uniform of an adult I'm now an adult so I am going to fake it until I make it this these pieces of clothing are going to make me fit in as an adult woman a young adult woman who wants to be taken seriously didn't work I got blisters because one of the other things about me is I am hyperactive I do like to walk a lot and run a lot and do stuff so it's really hard to do that when you've got shoes that aren't actually that great for walking you'd be surprised at how many women's shoes and now that is a gendered thing but shoes that are marketed towards female type people are not actually suitable for walking and they're certainly not suitable for running so therefore they're not happening on me so my shoe cabinet looks great in um it's kind of lesbian chic I guess you'd call it and and I don't I, I think that's fair enough to say I have all the pairs that lesbians tend to like and and I'm good with that and I'm sure I hope they're good with that because if they want to borrow some I'm sure they can I'm about a size 40 sometimes 39 sometimes you know anyway we're good on the shoes so in terms of masking masking whatever there's a few there that people do I'm not big on them there's one that I can admit to that I think is fine but I, I have tried so I did try doing these things because I must have noticed that I was standing out for the wrong reasons and that thought that these things would be good but quickly discarded a lot of them because they were just the 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 the, the pain was greater than the gain so no so that really answers the next question. How do I feel when I use these behaviour management strategies that aren't right for me? So masking is generally not right for me. Being, trying to do something to fit in isn't generally right for me because guess what? I'm actually not a person who cares if they fit in. I didn't, I would have always said that about myself, but I didn't quite realise how strongly that doesn't matter to, or how, how much that doesn't matter to me until I've reflected on it as an older person and until I've realised how I live my life. Authenticity is really important for me. Comfort is really important for me. Fun is really important. Freedom is really important. It's really hard to feel free and to have fun and to be comfortable when you're basically going out there putting on an act to someone else so so there's that but there's more to it than that so the motivation to try to fit in was definitely strong with me at different times in my life when I started my career for example and I did get comments from other people other women who I was working with that I, I look scruffy some days or that I should try harder or that I should you know I, in this job you really need to wear blah blah or blah those comments never came from my bosses my work was brilliant and I, I, I stand by that. I'm a good worker. These comments came from my peers, which I think is really wrong. And I think that's a horrible thing women do to each other and I don't like it. And I actually don't even like those people who said those things. But, you know, it felt important at the time. I still, I felt hurt at the time. I felt more isolated if I was honest because I didn't care that they didn't want to be my friend or that they were being a bit catty about things. I just felt the difference between me I was like why well, I would never say that to anyone else why does it matter to you like if my boss has a problem let them tell me and then we'll work something out but this is awful and then occasionally I'd feel resentful it's like why do I have to change bitch 
you know, you can change yourself, change your attitude, that kind of thing. And then that, that builds up things like frustration, resentment, etc. Occasionally I felt I felt ashamed of myself and, and this was where um, I kept on, I had this mantra, I've had this mantra in my head quite a lot about if you keep making the same mistake over and over again it means you're, you're not very smart. I, I can't remember how the saying goes but then that would make me feel ashamed of myself but now I know it's really hard to stop making the same mistakes again if you're uh, a um, literal thinker so you don't actually keep making the same mistake it's just the same kind of mistake but different scenarios so that doesn't seem the same to me and you don't actually know what's wrong or different about you so I was holding shame that I shouldn't have held and now I don't anyway so it doesn't fit it didn't fit me well so so far on the masking front I don't think I'm a big masker but what about other things am I am I masking sometimes there might be more examples I haven't explored maybe it's people pleasing or fawning there's that too it might even be something else so let's that led me to think about behavioral and how do we learn how to behave what are the strategies if i was trying to teach someone how to behave maybe that will help me learn a little bit more or understand myself a bit more